So you all know what AT&T is, right? AT&T, the big company. That, yeah, that's who, who, who I get my TV from now. Isn't that interesting? AT&T uh, used to be American Telephone and Telegraph. And uh, nobody's used a telegraph in probably, I don't know, 60 years, 70 years, would you say? I don't even know. But at any rate, years ago, probably, I don't know, 10, maybe 20 years ago, they had a, a commercial campaign out, and it was uh, AT and T. And that, they had that little amper, ampersand thing, that's what that's called. Um, AT and T. And they were saying this is the, the, you know, they were focusing on that because it was American Telephone and so much more. And I think it was right about that time that they changed their name from American Telephone and Telegraph to American Telephone and Telecommunications uh, and, uh, you know, trying to keep up with the times. But at any rate, their, their emphasis was on the and, the and. And I want us to consider today, that's going to be our emphasis on the and. In uh, Romans 11 and verse 22, therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Now, let me say right off the bat here, we're not talking about losing your salvation. That's a whole, this is in a context and we don't have time to get into the whole I'll call it dispensational context. I don't use that word often, but uh, of what we're talking about. But it basically has to do with the Jews being cut off and the Gentiles being grafted in. And at the end of time, the, the Gentiles will be cut off. And, and I believe that's happening even now. The, and the, the Jews will be grafted back in. We're not talking about an individual losing salvation. All right. Verse 23. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, talking about the Jews, for God is able to graft them in again. Okay? The, the emphasis of what we're talking about today, we're talking about the attributes of God, and we've been talking about the holiness of God and the, uh, the, the uh, love of God, the, the sovereignty of God. Last week we took a little break and for Valentine's Day we talked about the love of God. And today we're going to be back in Romans 11 talking about the goodness and severity of God. Romans 11, 22. Um, why is it important? It's important that we keep things in balance. We talked last week about the love of God. And we, uh, one of the things I pointed out was how so many people have this kind of a grandfatherly concept of God who just loves, 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 loves on everybody. And he's really kind of a pushover when it comes down to it. You know, he, he wouldn't want to hurt anybody's feelings by forcing them to uphold his holiness or certainly would never send anybody to hell. And, and we have this kind of a concept. Remember back at Christmas time, I talked about the concept that some people have of Santa Claus, right? Santa Claus sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He's omniscient. He knows if you've been bad or good, so you better be good for goodness sake. And we put that out and it scares the daylights out of kids at Christmas time. Oh, Santa's not going to come if you're not good. And then Santa always comes. And so what are we teaching? We're teaching uh, kind of a, an anti-God. We're teaching a, another God-like figure, only this one is loves children so much, as, as our God certainly does, but he makes all sorts of blustering threats about, you know, the consequences of not obeying, but then in the end, always gives you what you want anyway. And that's the concept that a lot of people have of God. Uh, Hosea chapter 7 and verse 8, don't turn to it, I'm just going to quote one verse, part of a verse actually. Uh, it says this in Hosea 7 and 8, Ephraim is a cake not turned. Now there's two sides that we need to understand. And, and remember, all of this flows out of God's holiness. God's love is a manifestation of God's holiness, right? So we're not saying that this is the yin and the yang. There's two sides to God. But we do need to keep some things in balance here, okay? 
Ephraim is a cake not turned. What happens, and, and, and when I say a cake, you think of a birthday cake, but I want you to think of, not a birthday cake, but think of a, like a pancake, okay? Or think of a burger, if you like hamburgers on the grill. What happens if you don't turn, flip that burger, or that pancake over, and you just let it sit? The one side is gonna get all burned and crusty, and the other side is gonna be undercooked and doughy, or raw, in the case of meat, and it's not gonna be good for anything. It, it's, it's One side is gonna be crunchy and hard and sooty and blackened. The other side's gonna be just gooey and ugh, not good at all. So there's two sides that, of this aspect of God that we need to keep in perspective as we go through the message. And all of this comes out of God's oneness, remember? The Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We're not talking about dualism, as, as I said, the yin and the yang, and what's popular among many uh, Oriental religions, Eastern religions. Rather, we're talking about two opposite perspectives of our understanding and our observation of God. Think of this, if there's a huge mountain, I don't care where, anywhere, a huge mountain, and some people come at it from one side and they see the, the one side of it and say, wow, that's beautiful, you know? And uh, they get a concept of what that mountain looks like, but then they, one day they take a road trip and they drive around to the other side and they see it from the back side, you know? And, and they get a whole different perspective on it. It's the same mountain, it's just looking at it from a different point of view. So Romans eleven twenty two: behold the goodness and sufficiency severity, severity of God. Now, too many people, again, dwell on God's goodness. And so their theology is out of balance. And, and we have a lot of people today that say they believe in God, but they don't really know who he is. Hence, our series on the subject of who is God, right? That's why we're doing this. And there's a couple of things that cause our confusion. Number one, a lot of people follow a private religion or private religious beliefs rather than the word of God. I've heard people say it this way. Well, you know, you're describing a God who judges and who elects some and, uh, you know, well, I don't believe in a God like that. I don't believe in a God like that. Or they'll say, well, I know the Bible says this, but here's what I think. And people do this all the time. I mean, I'm talking about Baptist church members who, and I've heard it from a lot of them, you know. I got run out of a church because this was their general theology. I know the Bible says, but my God wouldn't do that. And the problem is, when it comes right down to it, they're not worshiping the God of the Bible. They're, they're worshiping an idol that they've created and formed in their own image out of their own minds. Secondly, we think that all religions are equal, and we get a lot of our ideas from pagan religions. Pagan beliefs, this idea of the balance, the yin and the yang, for instance. People put apply that to Almighty God in the Bible, and it, it doesn't work. They get a distorted image. Number three, we fail to recognize the reality, the reality of our own sinfulness, our own depravity. And that's, I think, one of our biggest problems is we don't think we're that bad. We're going to talk about that this evening a little bit more. Uh, number four, a lot of people have failed to maintain a proper balance between these two issues of God's goodness and God's severity. So let's kind of get into this this morning. God, thankfully, is infinitely forbearing and kind and loving. And he puts up with a lot of our stupidity, doesn't he? Thank God. But... You know, a lot of people have a, a view that that's all God is. And God wants to love you, and he, of course he wants to help you fix your family and help keep you out of debt. Uh, some of these Christian financial wizards on the radio that you listen to. He wants to make you live happily ever after if you'll only invite him to come and live in your heart and you promise to read your Bible every day before you go to bed for five minutes and pray for five minutes and and go to church for an hour every week. And that's, to them, that's the extent of the Christian life. You see, the basis of Christianity is faith in 
and acceptance of the forgiveness of our sin by Almighty God through Christ's redeeming work on the cross. Amen? So this Santa Claus theology that we're talking about that says that sin is no problem, just come to Jesus on your own terms, is a lie. And it cannot cope with the fact and the problem of evil in the world. So they come to the conclusion that God would save everybody if he only could, if he only had the power to. And he just can't stop evil or see it coming. And so they hold a view of something that's called open theism. And, you know, God means well, but he just can't help it. He just He's just not capable of stopping us from our, our evil. And, you know, his, our, our free will, they say, overrides his sovereign will. I, you know, I, something like that. So let's, let's try to see what the Bible teaches us about this subject. The goodness of God. The goodness of God. By definition, we would say that it is that which disposes him to be kind, cordial, and benevolent, and full of good toward his creation. All of his moral qualities, his perfection, his generosity, his mercy, his grace, and his love, all would come under this very broad category of the goodness of God. Uh, Exodus 34 and verse 6, the Lord passed by him, proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Pretty good description. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and that will, but here's the thing, will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children, upon the third and the fourth generation. Now be careful with that. There's a whole lot of heresy that people have kind of drawn out of that verse that's not intended. But A.W. Tozer said this, God's greatness inspires fear, while his goodness inspires us not to fear. The, great, the goodness of God is declared in, throughout Scripture. It's taught and applied in every page of the Bible. The foundation of all sound thought about God and the reason behind all of his blessings. 1 John 1 and 5 says this, This then is the message we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Okay? How would we define... I'm sorry, let me give you one more. Going back to the book of Genesis, remember after God created everything, what did he say? God looked at everything he had made Behold, it was very good. Everything God does is good. That's, you, need to, you need to understand that. That's a truth we need to comprehend. Everything our God does is good and right. Uh, let's talk about how we would define the goodness of God as it's manifest on us, his creation, his creatures. Here's where I really love definition that was given by one of my favorite authors, J.I. Packer. He said this. He said, the goodness of God can be summarized in one word, and that's the word life. That's the word life. Note the text here. It says, behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee, toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you'll be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in. Now we're talking here about the nation of Israel and the Gentiles, not individual believers. However, in the analogy, we have a picture of the loss of life being cut off, or a grafting in, and that is to say, plugging into a source of life. Okay? So Packer speaks of the goodness of God's life. The, the biblical way of putting this, he says, is would be safe to say that God is good to all in some ways and good to some in all ways. Say that again. God is good to all in some ways and good to some in all ways. The Bible says in Psalm 145 in verse 9, the Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works. Um, so, lost people.
people experience a measure of God's goodness as long as they're alive and not in hell. The only place that they're completely devoid of any sense of God's goodness is when they die and go to hell. And until they die and go to hell, they're experiencing a measure of God's goodness. The saved will experience all of God's goodness for all of eternity. Still, given the blessings of human life, air, food, relationships, etc., from a human standpoint, the chance to be saved and the benefits of living under some semblance of biblical standards and moral codes. And the Bible says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. It's because of God's goodness or God's benevolence, his generosity. A disposition to give to others in a way that has no personal motive, not limited to what the recipients deserve, but consistently going beyond expressing the simple wish that others should have what is needed to make them happy. That's a definition, a, a Packer's definition of God's goodness and benevolence. The biblical word for that is what? Grace. Now, theologians will speak of common grace or special grace. When the singers of Israel were called upon to give thanks to God for his goodness, it was in response to his mercy. Over and over again, we read in the Old Testament, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. You can write these down. Psalm 106, verse 1, 107, verse 1, 118, verse 1, 136, verse 1. 100 verse 4, Jeremiah 33 and verse 11, I'll put that on the screen. They were thinking of God's deliverance from Egypt and his repeated forgiveness. And remember, his deliverance from Egypt was what? It was a picture of salvation, right? Salvation. In Romans, Paul spoke of his willingness to give life and salvation. And so that's a definition. God's goodness is demonstrated and bestowed on us as long as we're living. Life is an expression of his goodness. And it's only cut off when a lost person dies and goes to hell. Until then, a lost person living on earth is experiencing at least some measure of God's goodness. So how is it demonstrated? Uh, <coughs> one of my favorite Psalms. I mentioned it a second ago, Psalm 107. Starts out with these words, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. It actually doesn't start with those words. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It says in verse 8, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. And for his wonderful works to the children of men. It says the same thing in verse 15 and in verse 21 and in verse 31 as it deals with four categories of people. I've, I've preached a sermon on this uh, many times. I don't know when it was when I preached it here. I probably, I'm sure I have, but he shows the lost the way out of their lostness. He shows prisoners a way of deliverance from their bondage. He speaks to fools who are in trouble because of their own foolishness. He sends his word to heal them. And then those who are going out to sea, doing exactly as they're supposed to do, storms of life come and God rescues them even out of those storms. There have had them. No, you know, it's not a judgment. It's not, it's just storms that come. Experiences of life. So we see the goodness of God Declared in Scripture, defined, and then demonstrated in all areas of our lives. Okay, so let's talk about the severity of God. Behold the goodness and severity of God. Severe, of course, comes from severity comes from the word severe. You know, defined uh, in Paul's Paul's word in uh, Romans eleven twenty two means literally cutting off to sever. Okay. 
to sever. God's severity then is his decisive removal of his goodness. The cutting off of his goodness. For whom? For those who have rejected or spurned his goodness. You understand that? God shows his goodness to all in some ways, to some in all ways. What brings about the severity of God is when someone rejects his goodness and they are cut off, they are severed from the source of that goodness. Again, going back to Exodus 34 and 6. The Lord passed by and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But then it says, and he will in no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity on the fathers, upon the children, and upon the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So what's the problem? What's the problem? <laughs> Again, Psalm 50. I want to make sure I give you the right verse. Verse 20, I believe it is. Was it Chris? Remember we looked at it. Chris came and he said, what verse is that? And I told him and I told him the wrong one. So let me get it right now. Psalm 50. Verse 22, now consider this, you forget God. No, that's not it either. I'm sorry. Where was it, Chris? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing it. Well, it's, it's where he says, uh, verse 21, right there it is. These things you've done and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you. See? God kept silent. I'm going to write it down here so I get it right next time. God saw our wickedness. And it went on. And it went on. And we thought that because we weren't immediately zapped and judged, <coughs> that we were somehow getting away with something, that God was overlooking us. God was like Santa Claus that says, you know, you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm coming to town, but you know what? On Christmas morning, it's all presents are always there no matter what. God says, no, no, no. I will execute the fierceness of my wrath. This act of severity that Paul spoke of was God's rejection of Israel as a body due to their rejection of the Messiah and the gospel. And he says, the same severity will fall on you. Unless you repent. Romans 10, 3. They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. You see, Israel's attitude was that they presumed on God's goodness and his grace and disregarded the absolute manifestation of his goodness, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. God's reaction had been swift and decisive. Within 40 years, they were no longer a nation. They were scattered to the four winds. But he kept his promise to them and he brought them back together. In 1948, he brought them back into the land. In 1967, he gave them back Jerusalem. The severity of God, the cutting off. What does it mean to be cut off? The Bible speaks of Messiah being cut off in the book of Daniel. That means he was crucified. He, he died. So what's the design of God's severity? You see, behind every display of God's goodness, there's a warning of severity if that offering of his goodness is rejected. Romans eleven nineteen. You will say that branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off. For unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. If you do not respond 
to God's grace in gratitude and love, we will have only ourselves to blame if we come under his retributive judgment. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It says, Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. We know that the judgment of God is according to the truth against those who practice such things. And do not think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God. Do you despise the riches and goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent hearts, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That word impenitent means unrepentant. Unrepentant. He says, do you think lightly you despise the riches and goodness. Here's that same list that we saw in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6. His kindness and goodness and forbearance and patience. Not knowing that the goodness of God is what leads you to repentance. When God shows you mercy. When God shows you grace. When God shows you his goodness and his patience. And he doesn't kill you the moment you sin against him. It's to give you space to repent. It's to give you space to repent. I was with a, in a church years ago and a good friend of mine came to preach a revival. And uh, as we were talking, I, I told him about some of the things that had been going on in the church. And he looked at me and he said, why hasn't God killed that guy? That took me back a little bit. Why hasn't God just killed that guy? That was his world. That's where he lived. He expected that God, when, and this is a guy that when he prayed, God answered and spoke and, and he had that kind of relationship. Uh, somebody said, uh, if, if, if you ever find out that he's praying for God to kill you, you better go buy a suit, you know, to be laid out in this, the implication. Why hasn't God killed that guy? It's because the patience and the goodness and the kindness and the forbearance of God, the goodness of God, leads us to repentance. Those who fail to respond and repent in response to God's goodness can't complain if one day demonst the demonstrations of his goodness are cut off, can they? I give you time to do it. God's severity delayed, let her see. God's not impatient with his severity. Rather incredibly patient. Nehemiah 9 and 17, he says, You are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness or goodness. You didn't forsake your people. Psalm 86, 15. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, goodness, and truth. Peter speaks of how God waited in the days of Noah and 1 Peter 3 and verse 20. Um, Romans 9, 22. What if God, what if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering vessels of wrath that were fitted for destruction? Peter and John both speak of God's patience, giving space to repent in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, talking about in the days of Noah. And then in Revelation 2 and verse 21, talking about uh, uh, the, the, the church, he said, I, I gave you space to repent, but now you haven't, so I'm going to throw you down on a bed like a harlot because you didn't repent. No wonder that the New Testament stresses the duty of Christians to 
forbear and forgive since we have been the recipients of God's grace and mercy and patience and forbearance. Forbearing and forgiving one another, as it says, even as Christ has forgiven you. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also you do. Colossians 3 and verse 13. So, let me give you three lessons, three takeaways from this. Number one, we must appreciate the goodness of God. You know, we didn't sing it today, we could have. Count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you, it will astound you what the Lord has done. How good has God been to you, to me, to us as a church, to us as a nation, to us as a people. Romans 2 and verse 4, do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing? Don't you know? In other words, don't you know that the goodness of God is supposed to lead you to repentance? I paraphrase that a little, but that's the gist of it. Psalm 116 and verse 12, what shall I render to the Lord for all his goodness to me? What shall I give back to God for all his goodness? It says this, I'll take the cup of salvation. I'll call on the name of the Lord. I'll pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of his people. Here's what I'll do in response to God's goodness. I'll receive his gift of salvation. I'll accept his forgiveness. I'll crown him king of my life. I'll receive him as my savior. We've got to appreciate the goodness of God. Number two, we've got to appreciate the patience of God. Oh my goodness. Think of how God has borne with you and what all he has put up with and all that he has forgiven you of and me and how he still does when so much in our lives are unworthy of him. Listen, everybody's got, everybody's got something more important to do than come to the Lord's house and worship him. You know, if we got it right, we would never go home from here. Or where I, you know, it's not here. It's not Emmanuel. It's not corner of Lake Ridge and Green Hill. Although I'd recommend it, uh, you know. If we had any sense, we'd spend our entire lives, every waking moment of every day, worshiping and praising and singing praises to God. Why would you want to go home? You know, I, I get every week. You know, I try to get you out of here on time. But then I sometimes wonder, why? What do we have to do? I don't know, you gotta go to the grocery store, you gotta pick up the kids, you gotta take them to the soccer frame, you gotta go here and there and everywhere. What's more important than being in the Lord's house? Seriously. What is more important to you than being in the Lord's house? Marvel at his long suffering. And imitate it in your dealings with others. Number three, we must appreciate the discipline of God. You see, if we experience God's goodness in our life, and the experience of God's goodness has not led you to repentance and faith in Christ, and you're trifling with it, you are standing on the brink of his severity. To the lost, I love this, Whitfield, George Whitfield, to the lost, Whitfield said, God puts thorns in your bed to awaken you. Ouch. But to the saved, he said, those thorns are intended to keep you in his goodness, keep you from falling into complacency. So he puts thorns around your bed so that when you're about to roll off, you, oh, you get back into it. That's how trials come. That's how troubles come in our lives. To the lost, troubles come to awaken them. To the saved, troubles come to keep us in the center of God's will and his plan. Hebrews 12 and 5, my son despise not the chastening of the Lord. Psalm 119 verse 70, 71, it's good that I've been afflicted that I might learn of his statutes. So as usual, I got some questions for you as we wrap this up. Number one, has God been good to you? Yeah, all the time, right? God's good all the time, all the time God's good. 
How have you responded to his goodness? Seriously, how have you responded to his goodness? Again, Romans 2, 4, despise not the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. So are you experiencing God's patience right now? Is he giving you space to repent? In Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow about his promise, or slack, King James Version says, as some count slackness. He's not a slacker, but he's patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Or, are any of you experiencing the chastisement of the Lord? Can I say something to you? Thank God for it. Thank God for it? Why? Yes, thank God, because the Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 8, he says, you've forgotten the exhortation which addresses you as sons. Don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you're reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Are you experiencing the discipline of the Lord? That's proof that he loves you. I was and am a very imperfect father. I'm a fallen sinner myself by the way. And there were times when I disciplined my daughter and did so in such a way that I'm sure she didn't feel like she was being loved because I acted in my flesh. But the truth of the matter is, despite my failings in that area, every time I disciplined her, Badly as I showed it sometimes, I promise it was out of love. If you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. You don't take joy in spanking or grounding or putting your kid in time out or whatever you do, taking away privileges. The Bible says, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you're without discipline, of which we've all become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. I remind you of Hosea. Hosea had three sons. Jezreel, which means God scatters. God disciplines. God chastises. Lo Ruham. That means I didn't know. Lo Ami. Not my people. So, what was the progression? He had Jezreel. Then his wife became pregnant again and had a baby. And he said, I didn't know we were going to have a baby. What's the implication? Not so sure this one belongs to me. His wife was a harlot, by the way. And then the third one, Lo Ami, this one's not my kid. Doesn't even look like me, he said. I don't know if he looked like the mailman or what, but he said, that's not, my, that's not my child, that's not my son. The only one that we're sure about that really belonged to Hosea was the one whose name means chastisement, discipline. Judgment. So here's the question, the main question of the day. Wherever God finds you this morning, will you repent and return to Him so that you can experience, listen, the fullness of His goodness? All of His goodness. You're experiencing some of it wherever you are. If you're lost and a blasphemer and a 
reprobate, and you're living in the world, and you're miles and miles away from God, if you belong to Him, you still bear His name. You still, even if you're not saved, if you, you belong to Him, you don't belong to Him, you still bear His likeness. You're created in His image. You have a measure of His goodness. But you see, he calls us to come home and to come to him and return to him and repent so that we can experience all, the full measure of his goodness. We fail to understand God when we lose our sense of balance. When we understand that God's relative attributes are dependent on his absolute attributes, oneness, holiness. God, that's why in, in 2 Timothy it says God cannot deny himself. He's, he can't go against who he is. And he is so holy that he cannot endure sin. He must judge it. And so we've got to understand God's love and his justice and his mercy and his wrath and his goodness his severity that all stem from his oneness and his holiness. Don't make him in your own image. Don't make him the mistake of thinking that he's like you. He is absolutely holy and absolutely just and absolutely righteous and absolutely loving but also absolutely Severe. I'm reminded, and I'll close with this. When I was a kid, I, I never was really into the whole Lewis books. I, I came to read Lewis later in life and see some of the, the movies, the Narnia series that came out. So I, I have a different perspective from someone who grew up on it. It's all kind of new to me and, and uh, I'm just fascinated. But one of my favorite lines is one that I'm sure you're familiar with if, you're, if you know Lewis at all. It's the end of the, the Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe where Lucy, I believe, is talking to the little beaver or the badger or whatever he is about Aslan. And he says, remember this, he's not a tame lion, but he's good. He's not a tame lion, but he is good. Our God is not Indulgent. Our God is not like a grandfather that's going to spoil you. Oh, but he loves you. He loves you. And if you belong to him, he will love you for all of eternity. If you don't belong to him today, you're experiencing a measure of his grace and his goodness just by the fact that you're alive and breathing and here today. Don't you turn to him and receive him as Savior and Lord of your life so that you might experience his goodness, all of his goodness for all of eternity.